<laughs> so um, uh, thank you very much. I'm actually really delighted to have the opportunity. A little nervous, so um, just you know, be gentle at first, and then you can get dug in later. Um, I've been struggling to try and figure out how to open this talk, and I was just sitting here just thinking about it a little bit, and I realized that I want to give you just a little anecdote to get started, and it's more about me than it is about the physics. So I'm going to start out really slow. And I'm going to start out by reminding you what general relativity is about and how it works. And I was just thinking, you know, why is it that I was in general relativity? Why did I go into that field? Well, it turns out I was just lucky enough that I was born in 66. And of course, black holes were really just beginning to be understood in 66. We had Hawking, we had Thorne, we had all these great guys who were just discovering all kinds of new things. And so over the next decade or so, there were popular talks, books written, and so forth. And in particular, I remember one thing. It was in the 80s. I was on a trip to the US with my parents. And I kept on going to the bookstore. And all I did was buy books about Einstein. And that's what I did every time. So I started to actually read these books about Einstein and just became fascinated about the theory and wanted to understand more. So that's where I started and got my interest in GR. And really, um, it still persists to today. So let's actually talk a little bit about GR. It's a very old theory. Most of you probably already know. You know, 1915, Einstein came along and figured out that when he tried to combine the ideas of special relativity with um, the ideas of um, the with with gravity, he came to this new theory that he needed to actually um, explain to the rest of the world, and this was general relativity. The theory itself is actually nicely captured in this cartoon. This cartoon is um, this cartoon is a, a picture that actually originates with um, John Wheeler. And it's the idea that when you take a look at what Einstein learned, he basically decided that, first of all, space-time had to be curved. And second of all, that the matter that was present in the space-time had to actually tell you how space-time should curve. And so the essence of his theory was to figure out a way in which to put together the curvature of the space-time to tell you how the matter should move in the space-time, and then the matter tell space-time how to curve. You've got this nonlinear interaction between the two sides of the equation. Now, for those who are a little mathematically inclined, I just wanted to throw up the equation. I actually had a little picture of Einstein up there with them, one version of the equation. Tempted to try and use photo, photo booth to get a picture of me with the other one. But it's uh, sort of perhaps just a little much. Uh, so the, uh, the, the essence of the equations, again, are that somehow on the left-hand side of the equation, we capture information about the curvature of space-time. And then on the right-hand side of the equation, we capture information about the um, matter that is in space-time. And these simple equations, simple-looking equations, then capture this whole essence um, at the time. Now, the thing about Einstein's theory is that then, of course, the first thing he had to do, as we all know, is he had to figure out that it actually did better than Newtonian gravity. So the very first thing that he was able to show and this was true, I'm going to, this is going to be a little tricky with the screen in the way, so if some people may want to... Uh, the part right here, okay. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. So first of all, 1915 was the, the date in which he actually discovered, that he, he, he brought the theory out and figured it out and brought it forward. And in particular then, one of the things that he did in that year was to explain <coughs> what's called the periastron shift. <coughs> perihelion shift, actually, of the planet Mercury. So what exactly is that? So let me give you a little cartoon to try and explain, in case you haven't seen it. And by the way, people should sort of speed me up or interject if I'm kind of going too slow or slow me down if I'm going too fast. All right. So the first thing is that general relativity tells you that the matter causes the space-time to curve. Okay. So this is just a little cartoon image of that. You've got a star in the middle, causes the space-time to curve. And then objects that go around the star actually follow what in that curved space-time is its shortest path through the space-time. Okay. There's a particular definition of it. It's called a geodesic. But it's the shortest path through the curved space. And all of the particles that move around this star then follow shortest paths. 
And Einstein went along and took his theory and he said, well, according to observations of the planet Mercury going around the sun, the, the periastron shifts by 43 arc seconds per century. And that was an observational piece of evidence. It was known, but couldn't be explained by Newtonian gravity. And what he did was he checked that his theory actually explained it. Right? So suddenly, we now have this explanation that actually says, OK, I can explain this piece of astronomy that was not understood before. So that was a check mark, and that was done in 1915. But if you then continue to follow his theory through, um, the next thing that he predicted, and he predicted this at the same time, was the bending of light. The bending of light, therefore, is predicted in 1915 based on GR. And the very nice thing about that is that Arthur Eddington comes along and says, hey, we've got an upcoming um, total solar eclipse that will be observable. And so what I can do is I can go down and I can use this to actually try and figure out whether or not light really bends. Yep. So I'm partly asking a question to remind people that this is informal and you can ask questions. But <laughs> <laughs> on the prior slide about shortest path, it's shortest path in time, not distance. In space time. <clears throat> so it's in both. The distance as measured is in the four dimensional space time as a whole, not just in what we think of as our normal three dimensions of space. So it's when you combine them in the special way that Einstein understood you measure the shortest distance. Okay? And please do jump in. Look, I'm going to just it's I'm going to go go fast or slow and I'll kind of speed up too much, so slow me down by asking questions, all right? So the bending of light is a similar thing. The the light as we as we know, right? Light behaves both as particle and and as wave. You've all read this in the popular articles and you've all read this in in probably your your physics textbook in when you were at university. Um, and you can think of the light that's traveling, uh, you can think of it as a particle. When it's less a particle, then it follows these shortest distance in space-time. And those, as a result, those shortest paths in space-time are actually there. They appear to be like curves rather than by straight lines because of the curvature of the space-time, not that they're, they are actually the shortest paths. <clears throat> And so what Ennington did was he said, well, look, the great thing is during the total solar eclipse, I can take a look for stars that are actually behind the sun, and therefore the light from them is passing very close to the edge of the sun. And so it feels this deep potential as it comes through, and so it can actually feel the light and cause it to bend. And so this is a great idea and a great experiment. Unfortunately, the 1919 one didn't work so well, but that's okay. It was good enough that really people still attribute it and say, look, we measured the bending of light, it's good enough. And it was redone in 21, and so it was improved over time. But this was a critical thing, again, predicted in 1915, measured now in 1919. So what happens next? Well, the other thing is there are two other interesting happenings for Einstein around the same time. The first one is he continues to explore the, the, what his new theory tells him about the universe in which we live. Not just the stars and, and the planet Mercury going around the sun, but actually the entire universe that is out there outside, so the entire cosmolo cosmology. And what he notices is that general relativity says the universe cannot be static. Okay? It can't just sit there forever. According to his theory, that can't happen. It either has to collapse in on itself or it has to expand out. Okay? One of the two things has to happen. Of course, he dismisses this and then adds his cosmological constant, which he later calls his biggest blunder. And we now hear great excitement about it because of its relationship to dark energy. So this was around 1919 or so when this happened. But the thing is that when you think of this, the expansion then of the universe is actually in the end really the date that comes into play for when people really start to believe that the universe is expanding is around 1929 when Hubble gets his first um, results and proves that there's an expansion of the universe. It's actually measuring the change, the redshift um, of the distant galaxies and then, then, then relating that redshift to how far away they are, which gives him a recession velocity of the galaxies from us. But unfortunately, Einstein kind of misses his chance. 
But then the other thing that's really that I want to highlight, there's actually another one in the middle in here. So I, I've skipped to 1919 because it actually is already known. Let me put one other in here. Let me call it 1916. It's not really Einstein, but it's um, it's another person. Um, it's Schwarzschild, and Schwarzschild he figures out. He figures out the space-time solution. It's just something that's a solution to these equations. And he doesn't know really what it is. And Einstein dismisses it as a terrible thing. And something's really wrong with my theory. And goes, I guess, goes on for many, many years. Turns out, this is the first example of a theoretical prediction of a black hole. Okay. So this was in 1916. We get this theoretical prediction of a black hole. No one understood what it was. And it took another 50 years before people really began to understand the depths of what this, 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 um, this solution of Einstein's equations were about. But in the 60s, we get to see quasars in the universe. And people actually then come to conclude that the only way you can see these huge energetic objects in the universe is to have a black hole that powers them. And so people are led to believe, oh, suddenly you know, we've got the theory converging with the reality, and suddenly black holes start to come into existence. And one could debate when exactly we agree and conclude that black holes exist. Um, I like to measure it maybe by you know, uh, when Hawking conceded his bet to um, give Thorne, which is you know, sometime in about 1990, I think. So that's just one measure. But you know, Lars might want to argue with me. So, so, so that's the, the other measure. But now the last thing that I want to highlight here before I move on to some more actual, some more about the physics, is 1918. 1918 is the year when Einstein again. You see, I mean, Einstein's really the only one who understands this theory. He also told everyone that, of course, but uh, he. Uh, He's the only one who understood it because most people were actually just not making progress, but he was. And in 1918, he said, you know, my theory also predicts waves of gravity. And I'm going to tell you more about what these waves are in a minute. We're going to talk about some details, get some math going as well. But he says, there should be these things which are called gravitational waves. And then the question is, when do I fill in the number on the right to say that we've seen them? Okay. So I'm going to tell you a little bit more. We'll come back to this, and we might even have an argument about when we fill in that number on the right. Um, so, but, but, but let's see where that goes. All right. So the, um, the basic idea then is, is pretty simple. Okay. It really is quite a simple idea. Since the matter actually is the thing that causes the curvature of the space-time to exist. If you rattle it around a little, it means that you change the curvature. So that's the first thing. And that's fairly obvious, right? If I take some stuff and move it around, it's going to change what the curvature is. You feel intuitively OK with that. <laughs> the second piece that's really important is that actually, when you do the equations, it tells you that the gravitational waves propagate at the same speed as light. So what happens in this theory is, like other things according to special relativity, where information must travel at a speed that's less than or equal to the speed of light, these gravitational waves can't travel faster than light. And so any change in the configuration of the mass moves outward from the object where that change occurred at the speed of light. So if I do a little jiggle, I send a little ripple out into the universe that propagates outwards at the same speed as light. What, what specifically causes matter to rattle? Well, that, so, so that's a good question. And actually, the great thing is nature is really cool about this. So in essence, the easiest thing actually to, to, to answer is actually gravity itself. Okay, so let me give you let me give you a sense, right? So the basic um, idea about how you actually get a gravitational wave is you grab a bunch of matter as much as you can, right? You squeeze it together and make it as dense as you possibly can, and preferably as lumpy as you can, and then you make it move around. Okay, that's that's the recipe for gravitational waves. How does the universe do this? Well, there's matter in the universe, and it's naturally self-gravitating. So stars, for example, form in the universe. 
stars are pretty dense. They're you know, reasonably dense. Not the most dense objects, but good enough. They live in the universe for a good while. And when they eventually get to the end of their lives, they burned all their nuclear fuel, and I'm sure you've heard, I know Lars has given a talk to the friends about, about um, supernova before. So you, when it burns all its nuclear fuel, all the hydrogen's gone, and then helium goes, and so forth, eventually what happens is the star explodes in a supernova explosion. And in this supernova explosion, you basically take masses that are around the size of the, uh, the same as the mass of the sun, and you compress it down into a region that's about 10 kilometers across, you know, a size of Santa Barbara, right? And the nature just takes care of this by itself. So how do we get things to move around? We just wait, <laughs> and nature does it for us. So. Um, there, there are other ways. And for example, the Big Bang is a nice example of something that might generate gravitational waves. And so that's another place where we might do it. But there's a couple of examples. We'll do more as we go. So. All right. So here we go back to a bit of math. Um, I'm hoping this audience is okay with this. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to go through and try and explain what a tensor is or anything like this, but um, there's just a few bits to, to sort of take hold of. And the very first thing is that this is actually a formula that was originally derived by Einstein in 1918. It's called the quadrupole formula. It basically relates what is the strength of the gravitational wave over here. And that's all you need to, need to think of it as. It's just how strong it is, how much gravitational wave is there. And it relates it to the material that is in the universe. And that material in the universe is all buried inside of this equation in this funny looking um, symbol here, which has a more detailed calculation down the bottom for anyone who happens to have an interest in it. But it's not important what that equation says yet. I'll give you kind of an example, a picture to carry in your mind for how to judge whether or not it's good in a minute. So what this tells you is that um, in, in, the, in essence, it says that the strength of the gravitational wave is given by multiplying a bunch of numbers that are fundamental constants in the universe. This is Newton's constant. This is the speed of light. The strength decays as one over the distance to the source. So the further away the object, the, weak, the weaker the wave. It's grand. It's actually not, doesn't decay as quickly as electromagnetic radiation. Electromagnetic radiation goes as one over the distance squared. And then you, there's this term, which is the second time derivative of the quadrupole moment. Now, the wonderful thing is I can just do a little sleight of hand, and I can come across over here, and this is where I can tell you actually how to sort of intuitively get, gather what's going on. You see this g over c to the 4 is still here. You see the 1 over r is still here. But now you've got this m and this v. This m is just a mass, just about the ma amount of mass that is in what we call the quadrupole moment. And I'm going to give you a picture to understand what the quadrupole moment is in there. The second number that's there is the velocity. And the velocity is um, the speed of the quadrupole moment. Okay, so there's great words, but what does this mean? So let me just give you an idea of what we have as something that has a non-zero quadrupole moment. So first, let me draw a picture, okay, which is just a sphere. This is just a, a, a nice soccer ball. Right? Now, with this soccer ball, um, what we see is if I spin it around, you know, and I was never very good at sports, or else I'd actually have the soccer ball. And, and, but if I try and spin it around that axis, what you notice is the profile that you see doesn't change, right? The profile just always looks like this, this disk that you're looking on. Now, you can tell if something has a non zero quadrupole moment. Essentially, if what you do is you start with the sphere, and then you start trying to pick off pieces of material and move them around into different places to deform, to change that sphere into something that has a, has a different shape. And the classic shape I'm going to choose, and I'm going to use the term American football because I'm Irish and get confused otherwise. I'm just going to try and create an American football. So what do I have to do? I have to basically take away chunks of material from up here, right? And I have to add chunks of material down here. Right? When I do this, I end up with this nice 
object that clearly has this shape that's not the same as a sphere. Okay? So it has a non-zero quadrupole mode. But it's just sitting there. So it doesn't get any gravitational waves. You somehow have to have it change with time. It actually has to accelerate with time. That's, that's not a, a detail. It has to change in time. So the easiest thing to do in this case is to take your football and spin it around this axis like this. Right? And of course, if I just do that with the piece of chalk, right? so take the piece of chalk, and now this is a sort of like an American football, as far as I'm concerned anyway. And you spin it around the axis. And what you see is you see the profile changes, right? Okay. So you can tell that if I spun this fast enough, I generate gravitational waves. In contrast, if I take it along the long axis of the American football, and I spin it along the long axis, you notice that the profile you see as you look at it doesn't change. In that case, even though the object has a non-zero quadrupole moment, it doesn't have a time-changing quadrupole moment. So what you need to have is you have to have matter that's somewhere out in the universe and basically has to move around. And basically, the picture you see has to change with time. That's what you have to see in order to get gravitational waves. So. Um, I'm going to come back a little later on to talk about the strength of gravitational waves. Um, but in the meantime, what I want to do is now I want to um, tell you a little bit about and start the debate about whether or not we've actually seen or detected gravitational waves. So back in 1970, yeah. When you have a shape like that, the landing lift slide, yep. and you spin it, the that bottom. Uh, illustration there, and you spin it around that vertical axis, it will tend to drop, to end up spinning around the other axis, or the axis of the ship, 90 degrees. In, in a gravitational field, yeah. yes, absolutely. So if you have some external gravitational field that that's spinning in, you'll tend to get a precession of the yeah. rotation axis. And over time, that will change. But during that, that period when you still have the time-changing profile, you still get generation of gravitational waves. Any other questions? Because you know, this, I'm just, I'm just going to keep plugging away if everyone's, <laughs> if everyone's understanding this. But, yeah. I'd like to go back to 1915, if you don't yep. mind. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But the, uh, the precession of the perihelion of Mercury can be explained by the obliqueness of the sun. And also, is it not true that, what's that second one there? The bending of light. The bending of light, bending of light is also predicted by Newtonian theory, although not quite in such a large magnitude. Right. So, so there are actually, well, first of all, um, I probably should remember the full details of the obliqueness que question. I don't. Um, but the, the, the thing is that, in some sense, when we look at theories of gravity and other things in the history of it, the question is also how simple it is to explain something. And the, the context here is that by doing changes to the gravitational field, by either changing how the sun shape is, or changing what other objects are in the, uh, in the, the um, solar system, we could, in principle, explain something like the, the perihelion shift of, of Mercury. But they're all hard. They're all sort of introducing things that we don't really, either we don't measure, which is one of the cases, and, or that are just complicated. Whereas in this case, you start from the very basics, you have the very simple thing, and it just gives you the right answer. Okay. Um, with the bending of light, again, there is, in fact, one of the interesting, the things that I'm more familiar with is that you can, if you start from the idea, the hypothesis that light is a particle, which you know, corpuscular, corpuscular theory of light exists for a long, long time, from the 1700s. Um, you can start to make machinations that make you feel like you do get light is affected by gravity. And in particular, um, Reverend Mitchell, back in 1789 or 1729 or something, I don't remember the exact date, he basically did exactly this and then predicted the existence of what he called dark stars, black holes, if in effect. 
And so you can actually do these things. These are all things, but in the end, that uh, our current understanding doesn't match on to these things, and our current measurements discount them. All right, so let me let me um, continue on with this. So on the left-hand side here, what I've got is a cartoon of what's known as a binary neutron star system. So at the end of a supernova explosion and gravitational collapse, the thing that was left behind is a neutron star. When you get a neutron star, it's about the mass of a sun, our sun, and it's about 10 kilometers across. In the universe, when you look out in the universe, stars, many, many stars, happen to be in binary systems. They ha happen to be such that the gravi they're gravitationally attracted and going around each other, pairs of stars. Well, just in the same way, once you've had these supernova explosions, and there's all kinds of complicated stuff that can go on, but in the end, you can get left behind with a pair of neutron stars that are in what's called a binary system going around each other. This binary system, 19, which contains a pulsar, that's, that is a neutron star that's rapidly rotating and beams a radio wave beam towards Earth every so often. Okay? Um, when you actually take a look at this, it contains two neutron stars. It has this pulsar in it, which sends the radio waves towards Earth. And it's a great system to actually predict and try and measure gravitational waves from. Why? Because if I go back and let's take a look at our cartoon again. Oh. Yeah, here we go. So what you notice is you've got the two objects, and guess what? As you watch it, the profile of the two masses is changing in time, right? So what you see on your image is changing in time. So this has a non-zero quadrupole moment. So if you get two objects in orbit around each other like this, they have a non-zero quadrupole moment, and it is time changing. Yep. I think you just answered this, but the non-zero quadrupole moment comes from the fact that there are the two masses orbiting each other, even if they're both perfectly spherical. Yes, okay. yes, and it's the two masses. So in a sense, it's it's the extreme of this situation where you take all of the material that was in the sphere, and instead of just subtracting a little bit off the top and bottom, you take it all and you squeeze it out to two ends. Right? And so you get the non-zero quadrupole moment, and then the time changing is because you see the profile change. So this is a system in which you can actually tell that you've got two objects going around each other. They should generate gravitational waves. And um, in particular, one of the great things about the system is that this pulsar, this object that sends the beam of radio waves towards us all the time, pulsars are known to be very, very stable in their rotational period. And so it gives you a clock that's actually attached to the binary system. And this makes it very, very special. It means that you can figure out when this one of the stars, the pulsar, is at a given point in its orbit around the other star. Okay. And roughly speaking, it's, um, this is a this is a kind of a diagram that always looks kind of funny, um, but basically, if I could look down on the on the two stars going around each other, what I would see, they actually turn out to be roughly the same mass. So what I would see is I'd look down on them, there would be one of the neutron stars, there would be the other neutron star, and they essentially go around like this. Now they're not quite the same mass and they're in a slightly elliptical orbit. Okay? So they actually just get, at certain points in the orbit, they're slightly closer to each other than at other points. Okay? In particular, there's one point where they're close together, the periastron, and so this dictates a geometric point in the orbit that we can ask questions about. Now, Einstein's theory predicts gravitational waves from this system. Gravitational waves, if they're real, they should carry energy away from the system. Okay? And as you take energy out of the system, something has to change. Right? So if we take a cup of tea and we let it cool down, gets colder, right? The particles in it move slower. Um, in this case, 
And if we take the energy out of the system, what happens is the stars, the binary stars, get slightly closer together. And when they get slightly closer together, they then orbit each other more quickly. So it takes less time for them to go around once around the orbit. So what happens over time here is as the gravitational waves are emitted out of the system, the stars get closer together, and the time it takes to go once around the orbit changes. And it turns out... Yeah. Does that change the spin of the pulsar as well? Um, in this case, no, it doesn't. Um, it doesn't have a... I mean, let me actually think carefully about this. It, no, no, it doesn't change the spin of the pulsar in this case. Um, the, the gravitational wave, there's a funny thing about gravitational waves that is that the wavelength of them tends to be kind of as big as the system that you have. And so you really only extract energy from the whole system itself, not from the individual components, more or less. There's, there's some subtle things. You get a black hole with this. Yep, so the great thing is, that's going to be the great thing about this, is I had two neutron stars here. We know they exist because we see them in the universe. But if you had a black hole and a neutron star, you've got the same effect. You've got a chunk of mass here. You've got a neutron star here. They're going around. It really does, it radiates as well. And that's one of the great things about this is that we actually then even can actually see, in principle, if we could actually see the gravitational waves, we actually see pairs of black holes. Okay, right? Something that you can't see in any other way. And this would be a fascinating discovery if we ever managed to get to it. So let me actually finish this, this little section because I am going to, of course, run way long, but that's okay, I'll just cut stuff out. Um, so the, uh, the, let me finish this little section with just the demonstration and the argument. And let's just see what we all think. So here is a plot. This plot comes from a, a paper by um, Taylor and Weisberg. Um, it, what it shows is essentially what you can think of it as is the change in the orbital period, so the change in how long it takes these neutron stars to go around each other over a period from 1973 through to about 2000. Now there are many more observations that have come after this. This just happens to be the one that I actually had handy. The little dots you see here are the observations of that um, orbital period. So for example, you've got this one that was sometime in around 1998, and you've got it over here, the total change is about minus, minus 27 or something. Okay. The line here is the line predicted by Einstein's theory of general relativity based on the calculation that uses the quadrupole formula, basically, and tells you that this system must emit gravitational waves out into the universe. So we have a set of observations that show a change in the period. And we have a prediction of that change in the period from general relativity. And they match beautifully. Um, then they keep going. It's just gorgeous. I mean, there are error bars on these measurements, but you just can't even see them on this. Okay. Yep. Patrick, maybe you said this, but what's going to happen when they actually touch? Ah, that is great. We're going to get to that in a second. <laughs> let me come to that in a minute. Good question. So, so let's uh, let, let's have an argument first. <laughs> so the real question is, you know, well, does this is this good enough, right? So do we fully believe that this then says that Einstein's theory of general relativity has gravitational waves? Do we stop there? Or do we want to see those gravitational waves and feel them just like we can actually you know, stick our hand in the microwave and feel the microwaves? Sorry, I'm sure do that. But, yeah. um, so um, the question is, you know, and I think this is a, a long time debate that some people might have. I don't know if Lars wants to engage in it. Well, I'd be happy to wave you to finish. <laughs> But um, so, so this is what is usually called indirect evidence in the sense that we actually haven't measured the waves that are producing this effect directly, but we have seen the impact of the loss of energy as gravitational waves on the system. Okay. Is this gravitational wave a microscopic uh, oscillation of the attraction 
and repulsion uh, from another test object? So you can think of it that way. And that's actually going to be my next slide. It's going to be explain what happens when a gravitational wave hits us. And we'll talk through that. So it's a, and, and you can think of it that way in the, in the following sense. Um, the curvature of space-time Okay, is what tells us about the distances between things. If it's more curved, the paths are, the distances are changed a bit. Since these are ripples in curvature, then the distances between things that are sitting in the space-time actually change as the ripples pass by. So, so it is exactly that type of thing that's going on. A little dumb question. Why isn't it an approximately straight line? Why isn't it, why isn't it changing uniformly? Are they very close together, these stars? Um, let me just. Uh, well, the the equation that you get yeah. is is uh, is a differential equation that, in the end, um, it in terms of the change of period, I'm trying to think actually what it looks like. <laughs> um, it. Can you try and ask the question again a different way? Just just so I because I, I, I was about to just give a mathematical answer. I'm much preferred to sort of. Make sure I'm going to hit the right. Well, let me try and make it clear in my own mind. Yeah. The, 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 the system is giving out energy. The two, the two stars are evolving. They're giving out gravitational waves. They're giving out energy at a constant rate. So why isn't the graph a straight line? Why doesn't it just the time change uniformly? Are they close together so that the process is speeding up? Yeah, so it's actually it's actually what the thing you're measuring yeah. is not the distance, is not it's not something that varies linearly with time. Okay, it's a phase. And that phase just does not change linearly with time. Let me make sure I've got all of those things right in there. I think an answer might be that it's a very nonlinear yep. thing that's going on in the Geometry. The distances are actually changing with time. No, it's just it's just the p dot. Yeah, it's it's the p dot, and and that's that's it. It's actually in the equations. So it really is the mathematical equations that give us this. And so I and I don't have a better intuitive answer for you. Julian, this is not the period. The period would be linearly changing with time. This is not the period. This is the phase. The phase is one integral of the period. Okay. Move on. Yeah. We'll come back to it. I'll be on later. Let me, let me just so go back to the one question in the back because I think that's a great question. So the question is, of course, as I said, the energy is being carried away. So as this happens, the orbit shrinks and the things go faster. So what happens over time? Well, eventually, all of the energy gets taken out so that the objects get so close together that they touch. Okay. When they touch, they're no longer in orbit around each other. They just crash into each other and merge into a single object. For this case, you can calculate, knowing the masses and, and, uh, and the other information, you can estimate how long it'll be before that happens in this system. It's about 300, about 300 million years for this system. Okay? So it seems like a really long time. When they touch, is there a moment when they Yes, yes. In fact, there, there, moment, there, there can be. It depends on the particular system. So for neutron stars, quite often what you'll get is you'll get them sort of coming into each other and then they, they, sort, of, they sort of start tearing each other apart. Oh, and so they become in this spiral mess for a few, <laughs> for a few milliseconds. But um, in the case of black holes coming together, actually it's much more like that. They tend to come in and then they kind of go bloop. And you get this other hole that actually surrounds them, this other black hole that just comes and swallows the whole lot of them up. So it just depends on the on the particular system what the exact outcome is. Yep. I guess one thing I'm missing is why is this special to uh, binary neutron stars versus just regular binary star systems? It's not. So the only reason that is that um, the the thing is that the quadrupole depends on a couple of things. First of all, the mass of the quadrupole moment, so how big it is. Right? Um, but second, it also depends on the, um, the, the speed at which the objects are moving. In fact, if you take a look at, the, um, at Jupiter and the, and the Sun, the, there's gravitational waves being generated, and you can estimate how much power is radiated through that process. So it's not special at all. It's simply that they're stronger in the case of these compact objects that are moving very, very quickly. And that's the only reason I pick on it. It's a great example where we can actually measure the effect. All right, so I'm, gonna, I'm going to, um, watching time, 10, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 15 minutes. 
Okay. Um, so let me first of all tell you what the effect of the waves are. So the um, the next thing that we have here is um, the question is. Given that we have indirect evidence, what's the direct way of seeing a gravitational wave? Well, Einstein's theory tells us that there are two polarizations. We call them, just very nicely, H plus and H cross. Pretty easy to remember. The effects of them are easily described as follows. You imagine you go out into space and you get a set of particles. You set them up in a perfect circle. And then what you do is you have a gravitational wave propagate straight on through that circle of particles. As the gravitational wave goes through, if it's got some of this plus polarization, what you get is you get stretching and squeezing in the vertical and stretching and, sque and squeezing and stretching in the horizontal. So you get this effect where things go like this. Okay. And that's the effect of the gravitational wave coming by. Now, the reason that I emphasize this is because it actually allows us to sort of imagine an experiment by which we can actually think about measuring a gravitational wave. The experiment is going to be based on a ring of particles, a ring of particles in which I identify a few special points. The two magenta points are going to be special, and the point in the middle, this blue point, is going to be special. As the gravitational wave passes, it does the squeezing and stretching. Then it goes back to a circle after half a cycle. Then it squeezes and stretches in the opposite direction and goes back to a circle. During this, you can ask the question of what is this length as a function of time and what is this length as a function of time? And the strength of the gravitational wave can be thought of as how much the, the, this, this length changes from being the original one, L, to being something different over time. Okay. And so what we have is a picture here that the strength of a gravitational wave will be given by taking this change in length divided by the length, and we're going to call that the strain. Okay. It's the strain on those particles. So the effect of the gravitational wave is to do this squeezing and stretching. All right. So um, the next question is, how can we actually measure these? How can we go out and figure out what they are? So these are lateral waves rather than longitudinal waves, is that correct? That's right. So they're transverse. They have two polarizations. These are the two polarizations. But they're always transverse. Now, other theories of gravity predict other polarizations. You can get longitudinal modes. but not in gravity. All right, uh, or not in GR, pardon me. Um, OK, so the next question is, how do you measure these waves? How do you experimentally go after them? And well, there's a lot of false starts on this. There's some really good ideas, but they just couldn't manage to do it. We'll talk a little bit about why in a minute. Um, but we've actually arrived at what seems like a good place to actually try and figure this out. So here's a, a cartoon. This cartoon shows what's called a laser interferometer. The main components of it are the laser here, a thing called a beam splitter here. What it does is splits the laser beam. Okay, that's all it does. It has two perpendicular directions. I'm going to ignore these things here for a moment and just tell you that these, where the magenta is, are mirrors that are hung at 90 degrees to each other. Okay. And in the current experiments, they're four kilometers away from the beam splitter. So you've got a beam splitter in the middle, four kilometers to here, perpendicular line, four kilometers to here. And this now, as you can see, is you've got a circle. In a sense, you've got the three points that I identified before. The blue is the beam splitter. The magenta is this mirror here. And the other magenta is this mirror here. So if we flick back just for a moment, down here on this experiment, you imagine laying down your laser interferometer. Your laser is somewhere down here, beam splitter here. Magenta points correspond to those end mirrors that are hung out at, at 90 degrees. And now, because laser light is, is so coherent that when it goes out and bounces back, if the lengths of the arms are identical, you can actually set it up 
so that when you recombine the light, you get no, you get an interference pattern that's just beautiful with rings and dark, dark points on it. Okay. So what you do is you sense that on your photodiode. What's a photodiode? It's that little thing down the corner of your automatic garage door thingy that when you go through, right, and you and you happen to cross it or you leave the cat in the way or whatever you do, right, it senses that there's no light passing and so it says, oh, can't close the garage door on you, all right? Well, that's what a photodiode is. And what we do in these instruments is we set these instruments up initially such that the lengths are just at the perfect length so that when we actually bring the light back together at this beam splitter and pick some off on the photodiode, it's dark. Okay? So it's dark when there's no gravitational wave present. But as soon as a gravitational wave passes, you stretch one of the arms, you shrink one of the other arms, the laser light, when it come, travels along different amounts of time and comes back and when it recombines it actually comes back together and suddenly you get photons that get leaked over onto this photodiode and as a result you can measure the passing of the gravitation. Unfortunately when trucks go by, at least the one that I'm aware of, when they, trucks they go by, detect you, gravitational waves. Yeah, when trucks go by, you you measure you measure all kinds of stuff. So so the thing is, um, I'm actually not because I, I just want to give you now a sense of of where we are with this this experimental effort as we go forward. So I, I have a calculation that can sort of show you the sensitivity, but I'm gonna I'm gonna skip that for the moment. If someone wants to ask me about how you can be as sensitive as we need to be, I'm gonna give you that scale in a minute. How do you get a null point? Do you turn gravity off? No, no, so you don't. But the point is that actually the way these are hung, you hang these test masses, you hang them such that they're effectively free falling at the frequency where we're sensitive to the gravitational waves. Okay. And so they, they act as if they're just sitting on GOD6 um, in the plane of the detector. Clearly, we're pulling them up against the Earth. Okay. But they, they basically will, will just hang freely. Okay. And that's what we set up. So that's how we get to the place where there's no gravitation, gravitational effect on them in the plane of the detector. Okay, um, okay. so the, uh, the, the real key here is, so let me give you some of the technology just to get at you very quickly. The first thing is that one of the fundamental things that we know is it's the wavelength of the light dictates one of the fundamental things about how well we can measure things. But then there's a whole bunch of other, other things that we have to take care of when we do this to actually make sure that we can really, really accurately measure the length in this case. So I want to just throw up a number, and I'll just let it dangle out there and see if anyone nibbles at it or not. Um, I want to throw up a number, which is the amount by which the gravitational waves change the length in this instrument so this delta L is around 1.5 times 10 to the minus 19 meters that's the amount by which the mirrors move due to the gravitational waves impinging upon them and that the current detectors should be capable of measuring. For those who have forgotten the index notation, which is fine, I tend to have no problem with this. We take 1.5 <laughs> and... <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty small. Um, so um, this is this is the distance measurement, the accuracy of the measurement we make with these instruments. Okay? It's technologically fantastic. I, as Lars already pointed out, am a theorist, and so I don't have to worry about actually implementing this. But um, but it is a fantastic thing. Yeah. What range of frequencies would we be looking for for these? That's, that's a great question. So let me actually give you, let me actually, I've got one slide that's going to show us this and I'll talk through it and then I'm going to, I'm going to skip to actually just a few things that are going to tell you about where we hope we're going. 
So the first thing is I wanted to let you know that we are in the process of building this global network of gravitational wave detectors based on this idea. The US really, really did, was the breakthrough um, country to actually take to get it started. The Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, LIGO. Two sites, one in Livingston, Louisiana, one up in LIGO, Hanford. Um, there are then other sites that have come online over the years. Virgo is in Italy, near Pisa. Geo is in Germany, near Hanover. There's a new site being, being um, built out right now in Japan in, called Kagra. And finally, LIGO is actually beginning in the planning phase of adding another instrument down in India. So, and these, one, two, three, four, five, are actually really being built. We've actually operated the LIGO ones for almost a decade. Um, we didn't see anything but we're upgrading the systems so that we actually do have a good hope of seeing things. But they have not in the southern hemisphere. Uh, yeah. Yes, this is unfortunate. So we actually had hoped we would get one in Australia. And this Indian instrument here is actually the outcome of an attempt to get one in Australia. Ten to the minus 19, and we couldn't get it in Australia. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. does the mass of the mirror affect the sensitivity? Yeah. Yes. Yes, it does. Have to be the same mass. No. No. Well. That's a good question. Do they all have to be the same mass? It would make it more complicated to actually calculate the response. No, 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 they don't actually have to be the same mass. But actually, it would still make it more complicated to calculate the response because there are actually different properties of the noise that depend on the mass of the mirrors. Okay. But they're test masses, so they actually don't really care how big they are because in the, in the plane, they're just point particles being tossed around. Okay. But the noise in the instrument, which is the next slide, the one with what frequency band we're, we're sensitive to. Yep. So you showed all those separate instruments. Is yep. it possible to combine them to do a single measurement that would be that would not require as much sensitivity? Yes. So you can kind of do that. So the two in North America are actually set up along a, a, a great circle, just turned exactly the right way so that they actually only disagree with each other's orientation by the curvature of the Earth. It's about 10 degrees in the vertical. Um, and the point about that is then they're sensitive to exactly the same gravitational waves, or more or less. So in principle, you can kind of just add them two together and get, get, get an improvement of the square root of two in sensitivity. So yes, you can do this. Because there are two polarizations and the sensitivity patterns depend on the location of the sky, it's not just a trivial sum, but you can do it. And, and we do. We try our best at least to do it. So. Okay, so I'm going to, going to wrap up with, with two more slides. This one, and then what's, what's basically the end of, of the talk for today, given that I went so, far, so slowly. Um, I'm clearly too enthusiastic for myself. But, um, so, so this is a picture which is supposed to represent the question of the frequency band we're sensitive to. Um, there are two curves on this. The most important things to take away are down the bottom. First of all, this is frequency. How many times per second you get an oscillation in the gravitational wave? This is 10 hertz, so you get this stretching and squeezing occurring 10 times per second. This is 100 hertz, and I can't do that one. And then kilohertz, and I can't do that one either. Um, this here represents anything below this. If there's a gravitational wave at a given frequency, with a strength, say, here, so it's below this line, we couldn't see it with the instrument. Anything that's inside of this bucket up here, we could see with the instrument. And so the frequency band for our initial instruments was around 40 hertz up to a few kilohertz. And the instruments we're installing right now will ultimately have a sensitivity from 10 hertz up to a few kilohertz. 
and that's the bandwidth of the instrument. I actually can look in this direction because the question came from there, but I've forgotten who asked it. So. I was actually asking a different question, which is um, from like compact binaries and things like that. Uh, where do we expect the signals to come from? What well, so that's the um, that's going. This is going. Let me let me end with this because that's a perfect question to to end the talk on. So the um, first thing is you know that in the system we talked about, right? We had I didn't tell you the initial period of it right now. It's around seven hours. So it takes about seven or eight hours for the objects to go around each other. Um, but as they get closer and closer together due to emission of gravitational waves, they go around faster. And in particular, as they're about to crash into each other, they go around really, really quickly. It turns out to be hundreds to thousands of times per second. So what you actually find is the gravitational waves change in frequency over time coming from such a system. And in particular, they, they sweep upwards in fre frequency, getting louder and louder, or get, and also get louder and louder. And um, as a result, you actually see these objects eventually come into the frequency band. So neutron stars, neutron star binaries, will produce gravitational waves that we're sensitive to. And the kicker is what we'd like to do, and this is what I wanted to just end on, is that what we'd like to do is to, with gravitational wave astronomy, bring a soundtrack to the universe. So why do I say that? Well, it's because our sensitivity band is around 100 hertz. Okay? Audio, right? What do we do in the control room? We plug, the out, plug it into an amplifier and we play it out so we can hear what's going on in the instrument, right? That's what we do. So the thing is, we really want to add a soundtrack to the universe. And, and this is just an example of a gamma ray burst. Mm -hmm. This is where it was localized on the sky. This was the photon count that was detected. And we want to somehow add a waveform. This is going to be our signal here. So what, will that, what, what does that mean? Well, here's the picture that goes back to the question again about the frequency bands. If you have a binary neutron star system that starts out far apart, as it emits gravitational waves, it gets closer and closer together. At some point, the frequency of the gravitational waves it's emitting is around 10 hertz. 10 hertz is our lowest sensitivity, 10 times per second for these oscillations. Then what you get is the, the radiate, the, as the more energy is radiated in gravitational waves, the two stars get closer and closer together as they go around their orbit. And as they do that, they go faster and faster and the wave frequency goes up. You get a signal that looks like this. This signal has longer period between the peaks here than it does down here. And it has an amplitude that is going along like this and sweeping upwards. It's a classic chirp signal. Okay? This is a classic chirp signal. And normally I just sort of try and do my kind of thing, but I've got this sound effect. So, it's a lot compressed because it's 300 million years, so that would be good. Yeah. <laughs> so that is from 40 hertz. That is the actual signal that we would expect to hear when the wave hits the 40 hertz and goes right the way to the crash. Okay. So that and that's for something that's about two neutron stars. That's what it is. Okay. Now there's an interesting fact here, which is that the sound you hear depends on the mass of the system. Neutron stars are around, each one is around one solar mass, one, one mass of the sun. Black holes tend to be bigger. And the, the signal changes when you have a higher mass. It gets shorter, going from 40 hertz to where they crash into each other, and slightly sort of different in shape. Here's an example of that. So there we go. That was three, three solar masses. That's three solar masses crashing into three solar masses. That actually could be neutron star, but you get the picture. As it gets more massive, you get this change in the structure. This means you can tell what the objects are because you can tell the difference in the waves. Okay. So, so this is actually one of the fascinating things and where we want to go with our gravitational wave astronomy. I'm going to leave you by skipping ahead here because, sorry. So I'm going to leave you actually with two things. The first one here is this. I'm going to give you another sound effect. This one may or may not. So the last one we know exists in the universe, these compact binary systems. This sound effect we may. So that 
is a situation where if you have a supernova explosion that somehow happens to actually create something that's kind of the shape of the football over in the far side, then that's the sound it will make as it, as it emits gravitational waves. And I'm going to finish by just putting up this slide here, which is all we need to um, take a look at. And I can take more questions then. Thank you. Do you have a feel for what the density of these binaries that you can measure is? Like how many of them are there close to us? And how much do they contribute to noise from each other? And how do you deal with that? <clears throat> yep. So the first thing is that you know we just talked about the one that was going to merge in 300 million years. Sure. It's not the only binary neutron star we know of in our galaxy, but and there are a few others. When you put together that information, what you find is that you expect one of these things to merge about once every million years, roughly, very roughly, okay, yeah, in our well, galaxy. Yeah. Okay. Now the sensitivity of the instruments that we're building is shown on this plot. This is a this is our our universe is right in here. In, or pardon me, our galaxy is right here in the middle. Okay. And this sort of uh, magenta shaded region is the part of the universe that we should be sensitive to gravitational waves from compact and binary neutron stars um, with the advanced instruments. And all of these little dots and various things are the clusters of galaxies that we expect to be sensitive to. Okay? So we roughly expect to be sensitive to, um, I, have to get the num <laughs> I have to get the numbers right. So we want, let's see, one per year, so we need a million, and then it's up to 40, so around, around 40 million galaxies like our own, we expect to be sensitive to when we get these instruments to design sensitivity. We give about 40 of those things per year. And you're able to discern noise from ones that would interfere with each other so, in that? Yes. Yeah, so, so since there's only 40 of them per year, they only last in the frequency band we're sensitive to for about four, 30 minutes. They actually don't overlap with each other at that sensitivity. Deeper down, as you go further out in the universe, they do overlap. But yeah. So. Um, Question? Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, you're, do you look, learning anything, or can you learn anything about dark matter in these experiments? Um, not directly. No. no. At the moment, we don't. Um, well, it depends. It depends, right? I mean, is a black hole dark matter? No. Oh, well, in that case, no. <laughs> not, in the sense, not in the sense we normally think of as it modifies the rotation curves of galaxies. Can you see indirect effects of gravitational waves by looking at cosmic dust? Or, I mean, I would expect if there was this rotating set of neutron stars that the objects nearby, especially dust, might settle into some sort of pattern that you could notice? Mm -hmm. um, so the, the first thing is that from what we can tell for these type of systems, they actually tend to be fairly clean. We don't expect there to be much dust in their neighborhood. So as a result, we don't expect to see much from these type of systems. That said, there is um, some work that suggests that if you go to a different class of systems, namely the case where you have supermassive black holes in the center of a galaxy, and two galaxies collide with each other, and spiral to get the black holes in the middle spiral together and crash into each other, that can generate some sort of effects in the dust and material around it that could be observable in the electromagnetic. I'd like to say thank you for your talk, which I found quite enjoyable. And I'd like to also thank Lars for making it happen. <laughs> but I want to complain to Lars. Well, yeah, wait, I, I was going to start the debate. Yeah, but I want to complain to you. Please. There should be not less than 12 such things a year. Yeah. <laughs> Please get on. <laughs> okay, so the question, Patrick, is when... So, okay, fine, I'll follow on that. Which thank is, you. At what year should we plan for the public lecture mm -hmm. Where somebody could actually say they detected gravitational waves. But let's see. So, <laughs> so I, I have I have a theory on this. Well, no. So of course, you know, what would I like to bet on? Yeah. Well, what I'd like to bet on would be I, I'll actually do I'd like to bet on 1915 personally. 
100 years would be kind of nice. But publication of the paper was 1916, so I kind of that gives me an extra year in play. Um, but then, you know, now that I'm actually sort of know something about the instruments and guess when we're going to have real sensitivity, I'd actually probably, if I want to be a winner, I'd go with 1918. So that's 100 years later than 1918, 2018. One question? Yeah. Is LISA uh, something that detects gravitational waves, and what is its sensitivity compared to these advanced LIGO? Yep. So it is. It is something that detects gravitational waves. Um, the, the thing that you can... Um, so, so let me give you a rough, a rough idea of how to think about this. The, sen the frequency at which you're sensitive to the waves is roughly determined by um, taking the speed of light and, and dividing by the, the length of the arm. Okay? That gives you a scale. Um, then if you take a look at LISA, LISA has million kilometer length arms. So the frequency that it's actually sensitive to is much, much lower. It's down around 10 to the minus 4 hertz. Um, the actual amplitude sensitivity, so the strength that is relatively that it has to actually detect is about the same as LIGO. Um, but in that frequency range, you actually have a lot more sources that actually tend to emit gravitational waves strong in that range. And so in principle, if we can get spa a space-based detector up and the designs work, they will actually be much, much better for gravitational wave astronomy than the, the Earth-based detectors. Yeah. But it's a huge, huge challenge. Latest status of that? LISA, is, LISA as it was known, is dead. Um, Europe is pushing forward with a European-only version of LISA that is not called LISA now. I forget what it's called. I don't remember. But they're, <laughs> they're going to, there you go, exactly. <laughs> Art, indeed. And, uh, so they'll, uh, and so, so they, they hope to push that forward on a time scale of, to, to get start in a time scale of a year. But it's unclear. This is a big, difficult experiment. And, Years yeah, I would actually, so, and by the way, that as far as I remember is sort of, that's been the prediction ever since I started right. in gravitational wave astronomy is it's 30 years away. <laughs> All right. Okay, so we have to All right. Thanks. Thanks.